Hi, everybody. We're just letting uh, everyone join. So thank you very much for coming to see us today. We'll just let all of the attendees get online. OK, good. It looks like we've got most people now that have been able to join. Um, so thank you very much for coming along uh, to another ISIP webinar. We're very excited to have Tom Brown joining us to discuss the rapidly changing composition of the world's drug supply and its effect on the high risk for COVID-19. Um, as many of you know, ISIP is a membership organisation that's really here to represent, support and bring together all people working in the fields of drug demand reduction um, and substance use disorders. So we include in that the full spectrum, so people that may be volunteers or working at the prevention end of things to the medical field, the legal side. So we really do bring the whole field together, prevention, treatment and recovery to have this sharing, have the opportunity to have learning like uh, we are all going to in the next hour. Um, we have 12,000 members, so we're delighted to uh, represent a real global spread of those of you that are working in this field. Um, we work in three ways. So we have a digital offering, which is items like this and our website, social media, all of our digital communications. We have national chapters, which allow us to deliver our mission in country on a low, more localised context. And we also have a series of events, which used to be in person, but now we're moving to more regular online events like this one. And um, they continue to allow us to have that uh, more face-to-face -face contact with all of our members. So thank you again for joining us. We are delighted that Tom is presenting for us today. Tom Brown is the CEO of the international organization, the Colombo Plan, and he's an internationally recognized expert in the demand reduction and cr uh, criminal justice fields. Tom spent 25 years at the uh, US Department of State uh, within INL and earlier his federal career so he served as uh, Drug Enforcement Administration and finished that service as the Chief of Latin American Intelligence. Um, so he really is very well qualified. He was really very key to the inception of ISIP and was there from the beginning and we're very proud that he is our honorary president. So Tom, I'm going to hand over to you in a minute. For all of our participants, if you have questions throughout the webinar, please pop them in the questions box and we'll collate those and we'll have time for some of the questions, not all, because I know that you'll be a very interested audience, but um, we won't have time for all of the questions at the end. But we will you know, collate and hopefully cover those that we can at the end of the session. If we have any technical difficulties, please bear with us. Obviously, we're spread around the world and we're relying on different internet connections and computer systems. So um, we are, you know, we think that we've got this sorted, but that something always catches us out. So please bear with us if there are issues and enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Thank you for the introduction. I'd like to welcome everyone from around the world to this webinar which we're going to discuss the rapidly changing composition of the world's drug supply and its effect on high risk for COVID-19. I'd like to start out, you know, uh, 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 basically uh, with a few messages to some of our members in ISAP, mm -hmm. especially from Pakistan. Recently, we lost a member, uh, Dr. Mohammed Tariq Khan, who's a social worker from Karachi. Unfortunately, he passed away from COVID-19 several weeks ago and his family and his friends, our condolences. And also another one of our Pakistani colleagues uh, is in the hospital now getting treatment for COVID-19, uh, Munawar Sunny from the Sunny Trust Corporation. Uh, we wish uh, Sunny a, a speedy recovery. He's a very valuable member in our field in prevention and treatment, and uh, we'd like to see him get back, uh, uh, get back very healthy. Okay, to start off the webinar, uh, give a brief background, you know, on a project that we started when I was at INL in uh, 2010 and continue through the Colombo plan today. Uh, back in 2010, uh, at a time when new psychoactive substances were uh, appearing, those were synthetic equivalents of marijuana, of cocaine, basically that uh, could uh, duplicate the effects of marijuana 
marijuana and, and uh, you've read about new psychoactive stuff that's in the UN World Drug Report. There's new ones showing up every day that are causing severe health problems. You know, in response to this, the uh, drug cartels or traditional traffickers of methamphetamine, heroin, and cocaine, they had to respond to this. And the way they responded was to protect the market that they had on traditional cocaine, heroin, and meth by changing the cutting agents that they use for their various products. And the cutting agents beginning in about 2010 started to change from benign cutting agents that were like sugars like mannitol and lactose to more toxic cutting agents that included veterinary products, banned pharmaceuticals that happened to potentiate the effect of, say, heroin or cocaine, making it more powerful. And with that came more public health problems due to that. And that has an effect today and has a relationship to uh, making substance abuse users more susceptible to COVID-19. You know, uh, my interest in this, uh, uh, say, in the actual cutting agents actually started, you know, when I was at INL, I started at INL after I was at DEA in 1990, and I was put in charge of the International Drug Demand Reduction Program at the International Prevention and Treatment. And in the early years, I went to a number of international treatment conferences, like 1990 to 1996. And at those conferences, I had colleagues from the U.S. who were in recovery, who did very successful in recovery. Uh, they created their own treatment programs, and but also they were suffering from various medical problems as a result of long-term heroin use. But many of my colleagues and close friends in recovery had said that they always thought that the problems that they were suffering was they knew it was due to the heroin, but they also felt that it was due to the cutting agents that were used. And unfortunately, back then not much attention was given to cutting agents. The focus was just on the illicit drug itself, heroin or cocaine. But uh, later on, as we found out, they were correct. And these cutting agents, even back then, had serious health effects that we did not know until decades later when cutting agents started to be taken seriously. And then about 14 years went by after these conferences. And then in 2010, I went to a treatment conference in Sao Paulo, Brazil. There were several thousand treatment providers there. And they started talking about that they were seeing various medical problems and infections and diseases in their client population that they never saw before. And when I questioned them, it was limited to people who were using cocaine, mostly smoking cocaine. There was a big crack cocaine problem in Brazil at the time. And basically, on the problems that they were describing, it became evident that there was an obvious chain or something in the cocaine that was causing problems. Cocaine or crack cocaine itself did not cause these actual infections and diseases. There had to be something with the cocaine. Uh, fortunately, we had very good uh, relationships with the Brazil Federal Police. We had an excellent drug testing lab. And I traveled to Brazilia, and the chemists there, they reanalyzed 2,000 cocaine samples for us. And in fact, found out that the cutting agents were actually changing for, for cocaine down there. And it was explaining some of the problems that was being seen amongst the client treatment population. And so we decided when I was at INL to contact our colleagues in other parts of South America you know, if they were experiencing the same problems. And we found out in the Southern Cone in Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Chile, they were also experiencing the same problems. So in 2002, together with the DEA and, and the U.S. State Department and the Southern Cone region of South America, we had a crack cocaine in Tampa, Florida, to discuss the new cutting agent seen in crack cocaine and the effects it may have on health. Then that morphed into 2015, we started a formal project with IML in the Colombo plant to go around the world and test street drugs to see what the new cutting agents are, what the new composition of drugs include. Fortunately, we had, uh, due to rapidly developing technology, we had an eight pound portable drug testing machine that was able, that's able to detect 16,000 substances, including controlled drugs, heroin, cocaine, precursor chemicals, uh, adulterants, cutting agents. And so that basically, and basically uh, we would get a result by testing the drug in about you know, 30 seconds. So we're able to identify new cutting agents and compositions of, of actual drugs. And so that leads us to, to today, you know, what does this all have to do with COVID-19? Okay, we know that although COVID-19 is usually mild and most people uh, recover quickly, but certain groups of people are at high risk of illness and severe complications from COVID-19. That includes the elderly, people with compromised immune systems, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart problems, 
drug, uh, kidney problems, liver disease, lung disease. And, uh, but also people with addiction, they have numerous co-occurring health problems, which make them more susceptible to COVID-19. Recently, NIDA has done, in the United States, has done a number of reports. European Drug Monitoring Center in Lisbon, Portugal has done a number of reports. And certain international researchers have started to do preliminary reports on the effect of COVID-19 and substance use disorder. And what has been found out is that people with respiratory, pulmonary, cardiovascular diseases, in addition to suppression of the immune system and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, are all uh, basically at high risk for COVID-19. And various drugs and various cutting agents and adulterants have severe effects on the respiratory, pulmonary, cardiovascular, and immune system, making substance users at high risk for COVID-19. It's also been reported that compromise of diminished lung capacity in COVID-19 places users of opioids, methamphetamine, and other psychostimulants like cocaine at risk for mortality and severe complications from the coronavirus. Okay, we'll start with uh, some of the drugs that are out there. Some of the drugs are of abuse, common drugs of abuse that, uh, that can put substance users at risk for COVID-19. We'll start with cocaine. We know that cocaine is toxic. The toxic effects of cocaine are well documented, and most of which are due to adverse effects on the cardiovascular or heart system. Cocaine greatly influences the cardiovascular system and is a well-known trigger of acute coronary syndrome. Uh, an important point is that cocaine also causes increases in blood pressure, respiratory, and heart rate. And that's important because as your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, you have to breathe more. That means you need more oxygen-bearing red blood cells to carry oxygen through your heart to your brain. But there are certain cutting agents for adulterants that decrease those red blood cells, uh, putting users at risk for not just a via health problem, but also for coronavirus, which we'll get in a second. Okay. Uh, uh, pain abuse most often results in cardiopulmonary symptoms. Uh, the toxic effects of cocaine include arterial vasoconstriction. And vasoconstriction occurs through contraction of the muscular walls of blood vessels and results in increased blood pressure. And increased blood pressure is a high risk factor for COVID-19. Crack cocaine is a, is a very it's a serious form of cocaine addiction. Uh, crack is more potent than cocaine. You know, you know, typically a crack cocaine person can smoke uh, crack rock. Any, anywhere from 15 to 30 times a day versus someone snorting the cocaine, maybe do it three, hydrochloric three or four times a day. But crack cocaine is very addictive. Uh, smoking a crack irritates and inflames the lungs. And prolonged crack use may result in lung damage and cause a number of pulmonary conditions, including severe respiratory problems, which is a high risk factor for COVID-19. And smoking crack can also cause various forms of pneumonia, pulmonary hypertension, and pulmonary edema. Uh, crack users are prone to more severe COVID-19 infections due to the greater inflammation and damage of lung tissue resulting from smoking cocaine. Concerning methamphetamine, methamphetamine users may be vulnerable to COVID-19 due, due to the drug's effect on the respiratory and pulmonary system, the pulmonary system being the lungs. Meth causes pulmonary damage, pulmonary hypertension, and chronic disease of heart muscle, all high risk factors for COVID-19. Methamphetamine also constricts blood vessels, one of the causes for pulmonary damage and pulmonary hypertension in people who use it. Marijuana and vaping. Uh, NIDA has reported some results in marijuana and vaping, including the other international researches where both smoking, both marijuana smoke and e-cigarette vapor associated with inflammation of the airways, similar to that observed in patients with COPD and with the development of bronchitis and asthma, all of which are known to increase the risk of severe complications and mortality from COVID-19. Concerning opioids and heroin, the most well-known complications of opioid use and misuse include respiratory depression and central nervous system depression. Opioids have also been reported to affect the immune system and place uses at increased risk for many different infectious complications, including COVID-19. And as we discussed previously, suppression of the respiratory system is also a risk factor for COVID-19. Particularly with heroin, because opiates like heroin slow breathing, people with opiate use disorder 
may suffer from diminished lung capacity that could become fatal with the onset of COVID-19. And the slow breathing due to opioid use can also result in low concentration of oxygen in the blood called hypoxema, which can lead to pulmonary and cardiac complications. Now, this is important, we'll get into this uh, uh, later on, as there are certain adulterants that will basically reduce the oxygen concentrations in the blood that can result in pulmonary and cardiac complications and put a user at more high risk for COVID-19. Fentanyl, which is a highly potent synthetic, synthetic opioid, uh, since fentanyl is 80 to 100 times more potent than morphine and 50 times more potent than heroin, derivatives or analogs of fentanyl, such as carfentanyl, can be 10,000 times more potent than morphine. You know, fentanyl, you know, is drive, is one of the drivers of the opioid overdose epidemic in the United States. And fentanyl's effects include respiratory depression, you know, and, and basically a depressed respiratory system is a high risk factor for COVID-19. Now, the point we want to make, you know, we just discussed various illicit drugs and, you know, aspects of those drugs that could put users at high risk for COVID-19 and if they get COVID-19, a more severe form of it. Uh, but drugs are really pure, are, are very rarely pure. All drugs are basically cut. And basically drugs are cut with uh, two different um, with, with two different components. One is called bilioids, which are inert substances added to a list of drugs to bulk up the drug and decrease the amount of active ingredients. They do not have a health effect on the user. Bilioids include sugars like mannitol and lactose. Adulterants, on the other hand, are pharmacologically active ingredients added to illicit drugs to give bulk, complement or enhance the effects of drugs or reduce synergistic effects. Basically, these adulterants potentiate drugs like heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine and make them more potent. With that, you know, comes the chance of increased risk of overdose, fatal or non-fatal, and also the increased risk of near and, 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 and long-term chronic health problems, which we will be getting into. So I talked about back in 2010 when I went to the treatment conference in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and they're talking about various infections, diseases, and health problems amongst cocaine users. I said I went to the Brazil Federal Police to reanalyze cocaine samples, and then we saw that the cutting agents had begun to change. And then uh, in 2002, like I said, with the DEA and the State Department, we convened a crack cocaine symposium in Tampa, Florida, with the United States and the Southern Cone countries of South America. Where to discuss the new cutting agents found in cocaine, hydrochloride, and crack cocaine. And as part of that seminar, various countries sent uh, a number of, of crack and cocaine hydrochloride samples to the United States to be tested to confirm the presence of new adulterants. And basically, we found out what I call the big three of new adulterants since 2010 that we see worldwide in drugs. We, see, we started seeing finacetin, libamisole, and aminopyrin. And basically, just to give you a brief description of this, uh, the in is an analgesic that used to be an aspirin in the 1960s. And it was removed from aspirin and banned worldwide because of various health problems that it caused. Aminopyrin is a, a similar analgesic that was an aspirin in the 1960s. It was also removed for the various health problems it caused. And levamisole is a common veterinary product. It's a deworming product used to deworm cattle to get rid of parasites from cattle. It's the number one deworming agent in the veterinary industry worldwide. This causes severe health problems in users which we'll get into shortly. And so we also uh, started, like I said, in 2015, a project with a portable drug testing machine. We went to various countries to test the various cutting agents to see what they were. And to confirm we have the same cutting agents that we've been seeing in Brazil. And you know, we, we tested a cocaine paste based or smokable cocaine in Argentina. We confirmed finastin and aminopyrene, but we also found another analgesic that's in aspirin that has been banned in some countries called metamazole that also can cause various health problems. We went to Ecuador and we, we uh, tested cocaine hydrochloride and found the veterinary deworm levamisole and also lidocaine. It also is a, was a new street form of drug, a new street drug called H in Ecuador that wound up basically being heroin cut with cocaine and also finacetin, the banned analgesic that uh, then we'll get into the various health problems that causes, and diltiazem, which is a calcium channel blocker, which is used for high blood pressure. Okay, all these have very toxic effects on the user, which we'll get into shortly. 
We then followed the cocaine traffic across the Atlantic into Africa, principally South Africa, and then into Southeast Asia. And, and this is uh, basically a chemical profile that was done for a project by the South Africa Police Drug Testing Lab in May 2017. They took 50 samples each of cocaine and heroin, and they confirmed that indeed with cocaine, finastamine and levamethal was found in cocaine in South Africa. In addition, they also found finastamine in heroin and acetaminophen in heroin, which acetaminophen is also known as Tylenol. Uh, we found uh, in South Africa was very unique. And I know we have some uh, participants from South Africa you know, on the webinar here. Now, this is just an exception. This is not the rule. In some countries, a local drug dealer will further cut a drug. Like drugs themselves are cut in the source country. I'll well, use an example in Bolivia where cocaine base is made. So cut with finastin and amino pyrin. It gets shipped to Colombia where cocaine, where the base is converting to cocaine hydrochloride, where Obamasol is added. Then it transits through Central America on its way to the United States, where Central America, acetaminophen and dip and hydrine would be added. It then goes through Mexico where tramadol, fentanyl, or a muscle relaxing parasopital can be added. Then into the United States will be further cut by street dealers. Now, we found out in South Africa, we found a unique situation where street dealers were going to pharmacies and the chemical supply companies at night, breaking into the pharmacies and chemical supply companies, and taking various powders off the shelf and using that to cut heroin, to cut cocaine, to cut uh, methamphetamine. And some of the uh, chemicals that they had used were very dangerous chemicals. To give you an example, fortunately, this is only, like I said, the exception. It's not the rule. One dealer had gone into a chemical supply company, and he happened to uh, smuggle diethyl methyl phosphonate out there. Now, diethyl methyl phosphonate is banned in most of the world because it's a nerve agent, and it's the main precursor for sarin and foam and gas. But in South Africa, it's used as a flame retardant, where it is liquefied and painted on wood to use as a flame retardant. However, since it's a nerve agent and it's used as a precursor for sarin and foam and gas, it causes various nerve problems, respiratory failure, convulsions, and paralysis, and it was found in, it was used in pink tablets that were sold in gyms, it was sold as morphine to reduce pain from working out. We also found that there was a fungicide, a fungicide uh, that's used on, uh, uh, on vegetables, but uh, this fungicide called Manip has been banned, banned in many countries worldwide because it produces ironically symptoms of Parkinson's disease, including tremors, muscle, rigidity, slow gait, jaw stiffness. And a new street drug was created in the uh, Johannesburg section of South Africa, which is called Twite. And that was created by mixing Manab, a banned fungicide powder, with corn syrup and talcum powder. And you would let that uh, concoction harden, then they take the cheese grater and you would grate that out into a fine powder and snort that. And unfortunately, that would cause symptoms of Parkinson's Okay, and then we also found out other chemicals that were smuggled out from, uh, out from chemical companies included nit nitroethane, a, a, a neurotoxin, and chinomethanate, which is a fungi. And this was used into a unique drug in South Africa that's called Wonder or Niope, which is a concoction of heroin and marijuana mixed with numerous cutting agents and adulterants, including antiretroviral drugs. And what we found out that one local dealer was cutting this niope or wunga, the heroin marijuana combination, with neurotoxins, nitroethane and chinomethanate, that are damaged, that cause harm to the central nervous system, the liver, and kidneys, and also can, can, can cause cancer. Okay, so fortunately, fortunately, this is the exception to the rule. But in some parts of the world, local drug dealers will raid pharmacies and chemical supply companies and start experimenting with different drug combinations. They don't have degrees in chemistries, but they'll just mix different powders together, unfortunately test it on drug users and see what works and what doesn't work, get what gets reported back to us, given a great high and we'll use that. Unfortunately, as we see in many parts of the world, including South Africa, this results in serious uh, health problems. And so, uh, uh, also, which was of interest in Afghanistan, you know, at the time in 2009, you know, Afghanistan produced 93% of the opium and heroin in the world. 
as you assume with such massive amounts of heroin being produced, you wouldn't need to cut the product at the source. But in fact, the UN World Drug Report in 2009 has reported that the Afghanistan heroin manufacturers were, in fact, cutting heroin. They're cutting heroin with paracetamol, which is Tylenol, but uh, Tylenol is an analgesic and a fever reducer, but it can cause liver damage at high doses, and can, combined with heroin and insulator, can cause a double depressant effect leading to overdose. You'll also cut heroin with a laxative, which has been removed from the market because of its potential to cause a risk for cancer by altering, by altering cellular, cellular metabolism. Also, they were cutting with what is now a well-known drug uh, called chloroquine. You're familiar with chloroquine, as there's much debate today on, on chloroquine, on whether it's effective in treating COVID-19 or not. But, well, but well, what is known that chloroquine is a well-known anti-malarial drug, and it can cause hypotension or low blood pressure when mixed with heroin, and that can create a double depressant effect. And also, the heroin in Afghanistan is cut with caffeine. When you cut heroin with caffeine, it can cause normal heart rhythm and respiratory distress. So these combination of cutting agents in heroin in Afghanistan are fairly toxic. You know, they can lead to overdose, if not overdose, they can lead to chronic uh, long-term uh, health problems. Okay, and what I want to get into, in addition to cutting agents, such as adulterants we spoke about, talked about banned pharmaceutical veterinary products, also, when drugs, important to note that when drugs are manufactured, whether it's heroin, cocaine, or methamphetamine, impurities can result from the manufacturing process. Usually, the traffic is they remove the impurities from the final stage of the drug production process. But unfortunately, when we're undergoing, or we're undergoing an opioid epidemic in the U.S., uh, the Mexican traffickers couldn't supply the heroin fast enough, so they were taking shortcuts in the manufacturing of heroin. And that resulted in impurities remaining in the heroin. And basically, the six well-known impurities in heroin that the research and literature has shown that these can cause severe health problems if not removed from the heroin. And in brief, that these six impurities are acetylcholine, which acetylcholine, which potentiates the convulsive effect of heroin, it can lead to increased overdose problems. The six MAM which is found in significant amounts of black tar heroin or heroin exposed to moisture. It comprises 30% more active than heroin, which can cause central nervous system depression. Uh, Papaverin is comprised in about 2.5% of the, the opium poppy. It's toxic at high dose. Take with other drugs, it can make one drowsy, can worsen the effect, can cause a double depressant effect reacting with heroin. It lowers blood pressure and causes central nervous system depression. Like papaverin, noscopine comprises about four to eight opium. Basically, it's toxic at high, high doses, and its effects include increased heart rate. Now, unreacted morphine and unreacted codeine are present in poorly processed heroin, which may bring about a reaction to users, especially if the drug is injected intravenously. Okay, it can cause respiratory distress and death when taken in high doses or combined with other substances such as heroin and alcohol. So if these six impurities are not removed from the heroin, they can cause severe health problems in the user. And if they cause you know, compromise in the immune system, the pulmonary system, the respiratory system, they can also uh, make a user and put them at risk for COVID-19 and other such infections. I want to jump quickly to uh, to the Middle East, because I know there are a number of participants signed on from Egypt and from Saudi Arabia you know, on this webinar. A uh, major drug of abuse in the Middle East is counterfeit captagon. Basically, captagon is like amphetamine. It was produced in 1961 as an alternative to amphetamine to combat fatigue. It's been banned, but it, in the Middle East, there are various counterfeit versions of captagon that consist of multiple drugs, multiple cutting agents, or adulterants that can be very toxic. Uh, as part of our Colombo Plan project with INL, we have sponsored over the years two international uh, lab directors, uh, drug testing meeting groups, uh, drug testing lab directors from around the world to discuss what they have been finding as cutting agents in drugs of abuse. And we received presentations 
from our lab directors from Saudi Arabia who participated in those international meetings we had. And they gave presentations on what they had found in counterfeit capsicum. And that includes, you know, uh, controlled drugs such as amphetamine and methamphetamine. But you combine, when you combine amphetamine and methamphetamine, you can have a problem with hypertension, which is high blood pressure. And you know, high blood pressure is a high risk factor for COVID-19. And for rapid heart disease, you can have problems with that. And uh, okay, what we also have in various cutting agents we found that were added to the capsicum, such as ephedrine, which is a stimulant to treat low blood pressure, but it, but it can cause high blood pressure, rapid heartbeat, regular heartbeat, fluid in the lungs, it can do serious damage. There are other antibiotics like metro, uh, uh, metronidazole, which decreases white blood cells, and that will compromise the immune system. Theophylline, which is a well-known bronchodilator used for asthma and for um, emphysema, can cause cardiac, uh, it can cause cardiac arrhythmias, which is irregular heartbeat, and it can cause rapid heartbeat and cause convulsions. Antihistamines that can cause drowsiness. There's another antibiotics that causes low levels of platelets that, that would, and platelets help blood to clot, but this reduces those. Again, uh, the antimalarial drug uh, chloroquine, which causes hypotension and low blood pressure. Well-known antimalarial quinine, or quinine when mixed with other drugs, such as heroin and methamphetamine, can cause cardiovascular toxicity, which is damage to the heart muscle which makes it difficult for the heart to pump blood. It includes abnormal heart rhythms, and also quinine can reduce blood cells. Caffeine, a well-known psychostimulant, when you mix caffeine with methamphetamines or amphetamines, it can cause cardiotoxicity, you know, damage the heart muscle, changes in heart rate, and cardiac injury. So basically, this is a very uh, toxic you know, combination of counterfeit capsicum that can result in various long-term health problems and also uh, make it susceptible to coronavirus. Now, briefly, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to get into uh, getting some messages here. I'm going to check real quick to make sure they're not coming in. Over here. Uh, what's important, I want to get into some of the main adulterants, the health effects. Like I said previously, phenacetin was an analgesic, used to be an aspirin in the 1960s. It was banned for a number of reasons because it depleted red blood cells, it damaged kidneys, led to kidney failure, and also caused bladder cancer. Levamisole, like I talked about, was a veterinary dewormer, but in humans, it depletes white blood cells. Aminopyrin, another analgesic, was an aspirin that was removed. The reason was it depleted white blood cells. When you deplete white blood cells in a human, what that does, that compromises your immune system. White blood cells fight off infections and diseases. But when you use adulterants that deplete white blood cells, the user is basically, uh, the immune system is compromised and they're open to various infections and diseases. And this helped explain the problems that we saw in Brazil in 2010 that reported at the treatment conference. Different infections and diseases and health problems that had not been seen with cocaine use, especially people who smoke cocaine before. And that was due to these new change cutting agents. Uh, you saw kidney problems in people in their it, 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 in their 20s. You know, uh, they didn't have diabetes at that age. But what happened was the phenacetin, which which was uh, phenacetin basically causes kidney failure and, and kidney problems. So phenacetin in crack cocaine was causing the problem. Likewise, the various infections and diseases that were seen were caused by aminopyrene and levamisole, which deplete white blood cells. Now, levamisole and aminopyrene deplete white blood cells. You compromise the immune system, or compromise the immune system is also a major risk factor for COVID-19. So getting into these various adulterants and the health consequences. And as to explain, the banned analgesic and aspirin had caused kidney failure, it caused bladder cancer, and a reduction in red blood cells. That's important because red blood cells carry oxygen to the brain. And a reduction in red blood cells lead to low concentrations of oxygen in the blood. And that's a condition we previously talked about called hypoxemia. And that can result in various cardiovascular and pulmonary problems, which are high risk factors for COVID-19. So Amisole, the veterinary dewormer that we spoke about, Basically, that thing in humans, it decreases white blood cells, but I want to 
take some time here to discuss Levamisole because this is the major cutting agent. Uh, this basically changed the whole scene with cutting agents. It's basically a game changer. Levamisole, you have a product that's not banned because it's a, it's a common veterinary product. Also, in limited cases, levamisole is considered an essential medicine by the World Health Organization. In places like Afghanistan, it's only used twice a year in limited quantities to remove parasites from children. If you use too much, you're going to damage white blood cells. But basically, levamisole is legal, easily to obtain levamisole. But what levamisole does, you know, over the years, studies have been done on levamisole since it's been around and causing problems since 2010. And levamisole basically potentiates cocaine. What it does, it makes cocaine more powerful. It makes the pot more potent. But in addition, what happens is levamisole metabolizes into a menorex. The body, the human the, uh, body metabolizes levamisole to a menorex, which is an amphetamine. So when the cocaine high goes down, an amphetamine high kicks in. You have a levamisole, which, levamis, which metabolizes to a menorex, which potentiates, makes the cocaine high that much stronger, and also extends the high. So it's an ideal cutting agent. We've also seen cutting agents like light, light okay, local anesthetics that can cause respiratory depression if combined with cocaine or with heroin. Uh, benzocaine, among other local anesthetics, combined with cocaine can cause various blood disorders. We discussed the banned analgesic amino pyrin that used to be an aspirin that reduces white blood cells. Dopiazam, a calcium channel blocker used to high blood pressure. However, heroin laced with dopiazam can cause you to overdose because that will cause a double depressant effect. We've experienced this in the U.S. in April 2016 when we had uh, public health alerts put out by the Maine State Police throughout the New England area in the Northeast United States because of overdoses caused by dopiazam mixed with heroin. Dopiazam, when it's mixed with cocaine, also potentiates cocaine toxicity and has uh, toxic cardiac effects when mixed with cocaine. Spoke about uh, metamazole, uh, also known as Ziprone, which is another banned analgesic and aspirin that depletes the blood cell. We get into, uh, you know, two uh, common cutting agents we have been seeing, acetaminophen, which is pylamol, and different hydramine, which is Benadryl. However, if, you know, uh, acetaminophen is taken for pain or for fever, different hygiene for as an antihistamine for allergies. However, you know, and this is one of the reasons why for years, you know, adulterants were not seen as being a problem. You know, the main drug itself, heroin or cocaine was. Adulterants in most cases were seen as therapeutic. You look at the adulterants, well, dopiazam is used to treat high blood pressure, quinine cures malaria, Acetaminophen, we all take acetaminophen for pain or for fever. However, we know not to take too much acetaminophen because if you exceed, uh, exceed the recommended dose and take too much, of, I say six of these, six a day for several days, you can do severe damage to your liver. But however, it's easy for us to obtain acetaminophen. It's easy to obtain different hygiene or Benadryl. So for years, public health and law enforcement did not look at these adulterants as serious problems. But the point that needs to be made is, though some of these adulterants, they are therapeutic, some of these are not banned analgesics, these are medicines that we use, but using acetaminophen, if I use this for pain, that's one thing, for fever, it's one thing. But you take acetaminophen, you take these tablets, you crush them, and you mix them with heroin or cocaine, you have an entirely different substance. Now, this ups the ante. You're talking about a more powerful substance an entire new substance that's very toxic. And we've experienced this, unfortunately, in the United States in 2009 in the Dallas, Texas area, where a number of adolescents or teenagers were mixing heroin with crushed acetaminophen or Benadryl tablets. And what this does is this caused, this caused some overdose, some fatal, some not fatal. But what was found out was that when you mix acetaminophen or different hygiene with heroin, it it dramatically depresses the heart rate and breathing. It causes a double depressant effect with heroin and can cause overdose. So now we know that these adulterants are cutting agents. These things are not benign. This may be therapeutic to take for fever or the different hygiene is therapeutic to take for allergies. 
but you admit this was cocaine or heroin, you have an entirely different toxic problem that can, that can cause death or can cause severe damage uh, to, uh, uh, to the liver on that. So that's, that's important. The same thing goes with caffeine. People know caffeine, we have it in our energy drinks and so it is in that. Caffeine is a psychostimulant, but you know, too much of, of, of any product is not good for you. But when you take caffeine, and you mix caffeine, especially with methamphetamine, you can have various cardiac problems because uh, uh, irregular heartbeats, cardiotoxicity, damage to the heart muscle, it can cause respiratory distress, distress when combined with heroin or with methamphetamine. But no caffeine is a common, a, a, a common cutting agent when used for drugs of abuse. It takes on a whole different picture. On that, xylosine is, a, is another veterinary product but basically it's a muscle relaxant used uh, for animals by vets. However, when uh, it's been found to be mixed with heroin, and when mixed with heroin, this causes respiratory depression, it causes low blood pressure, it causes very serious effects. We've had a rash of overdoses in the United States, especially in the state of Pennsylvania, in Puerto Rico, and in Dominican, Dominican Republic, with heroin being cut with a very product, xylosine. Tramadol, which is very common in India and in Africa. It's an opioid pain medication. But when you mix tramadol with heroin, it can cause respiratory distress and death when taken in high doses or combined with other substances such as heroin. Okay, carisoprodol is a muscle relaxant. With carisoprodol, it would be found in the heroin in the United States when mixed with a heroin that potentiates the effects of narcotics. It can cause respiratory depression, which is the same as when combined with other sedatives or with alcohol. And carisoprodol, the common muscle relaxant, so combined with heroin, causes a double depressant effect. It will affect the respiratory system. And like some of these other adults have seen, which is assumed by now, that they will cause various problems to the respiratory system, cardiovascular system, immune system, the pulmonary system, all which, which could lead to high risk factors for COVID-19. Okay, uh, I'm going to get into really quickly a benzodiazepine. Benzodiazepines are tranquilizers used for anxiety and depression. Alprazolam is the common uh, cutting agent found in, in, in heroin. When combined with opioids such as heroin, it can cause profound sedation, respiratory depression. Okay, quinine is a common anti malarial medication. And quinine can be very complicated. I spoke earlier about colleagues of mine in the 60s and 70s that were successfully in recovery, but unfortunately had used heroin in the 50s and 70s. And they felt that the various medical problems they had, especially the, the cardiovascular problems, was not due to the heroin, but was due to the quinine. And found out decades later that they were correct, because years later, research in quinine had shown that quinine, you know, if you take too much, you combine quinine with heroin, you can do kidney damage, you can do cardiovascular damage, regular heartbeats, cardiovascular toxicity, you know, hypotension, low blood pressure. You can also have acute renal or kidney failure from, from quinine. So quinine that was just looked at, well, there's nothing wrong with quinine. It cures malaria. That's correct. Quinine, uh, quinine is fine as an anti-malarial, but when you mix it with heroin, you have, a, or, or even with cocaine, you have a whole different product that can and will cause serious problems. Okay, uh, so to basically summarize this, you know, why do these adulterants, why are they causing severe health problems? Uh, to give you an example, we'll take an example of phenacetin, the banned analgesic that was in aspirin in the 1950s and 60s that we moved. Basically, aspirin is not addictive. So phenacetin and aspirin took years. The problems from phenacetin produced blood cells, bladder cancer, kidney failure took years to appear because in the 60s, we did not take aspirin every day. We took aspirin if we had a fever because the aspirin had arthritis. It was not taken every day. And it took years for problems from adultery to appear. However, we fast forward to 2010 and today, the adulterants such as phenacetin are put in illegal drugs of abuse. The difference from aspirin is that these drugs like crack cocaine are highly addictive. So the vehicle of which these adulterants are now put are an addictive vehicle. So instead of seeing an effect that would take years, such as kidney failure, or reduced red blood cells, bladder cancer, we're seeing it within a matter of months. 
because drugs are addictive. Studies done by the OAS have shown that the crack user, a person who uses crack, uses on an average smokes 15 times a day, seven days a week for six months. So therefore you are accumulating, crack users are accumulating large amounts of crack cocaine, large amounts of toxic adulterants in their symptoms, in their systems, which is going to manifest itself in, in chronic health problems faster, which we did see in Brazil with the use of phenacetin in crack cocaine. So that would happen. So the vehicle is now an addictive substance. And so now the health effects from the reductions we're seeing, we're seeing them a lot more sooner. Uh, we also then expanded our project in the United States. If we receive these various cutting agents overseas, we're curious if they were also in the United States. We're also curious because we had a severe opioid epidemic that was driven by fentanyl. But studies done by the CDC in, in, in 2016 shown that fentanyl was detected in over half of the overdose deaths in 10 states in the US. But the question remained, if fentanyl was in the overdose, it was in only 50% of those overdose deaths, what was in the other 50%? And in 2017, where the Center of Disease Control was estimated, overall drug overdose deaths, all drugs, heroin, cocaine, meth, 72,000, uh, synthetic opioids like fentanyl only found in 41% of the samples. Well, the question is, what was in the other 59, 60% causing overdose? So fentanyl undoubtedly contributed to overdose rates in the U.S., but was far from their only cause. And so as part of our project with the Colombo plan, we got together with NMS Laboratory in, uh, in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, and they did various drug testing for various uh, states. And so we analyzed cocaine and heroin samples from Kentucky and Vermont. What we found out was we analyzed over 431 samples, and we found out that 54% of the heroin and cocaine samples contained as many as five or eight toxic adulterants in addition to heroin or cocaine. 69% uh, of the samples contained five or more toxic adulterants. 15% contained nine toxic adulterants. So we're talking about the, the drugs that more a adulterant than we normally contain. A typical drug profile we had from the Vermont Kentucky drug samples looked like this. And and we have since tested in seven more states, and we have not basically released that data yet because we are basically uh, still analyzing that data. But we're finding out in the United States that we have uh, drugs, heroin, cocaine, that are cut multiple times. We're finding drugs cut up to 15 times, and this consists of multiple drugs, heroin, cocaine, tramadol, in addition to fentanyl, numerous toxic adulterants, we talked about banned pharmaceuticals, that very product, and impurities from the heroin manufacturing process. These are very toxic street level drug samples. Uh, what we did was uh, we had a, a part of our project, we involved the chief medical officer of the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Vanilla Singh, who did some studies with us. And we published this data in the public health report that's put out by the Surgeon General of the United States to talk about that this added dimension, the hidden dimension of the U.S. opioid and similar overdose epidemic, that there's more than fentanyl causing overdose. In addition to overdose, these very toxic drug street combinations are causing severe near and long-term chronic health problems, such as for the heart, the liver, blood disorders. So these are very uh, severe and very toxic drug combinations that we are seeing inside the United States. It helps also explain the opioid overdose epidemic and the chronic health problem that we see. And also various drug combinations have been implemented that we've seen in Argentina and Brazil. You don't have to have many adulterants in the drug to have a very toxic sample. Like cocaine in Argentina can contain phenacetin, so that can cause kidney failure, amino pyramids, and then as well reduce white blood cells. In Brazil, we have various combinations in both cocaine that includes phenacetin that can cause kidney failure and reduces red blood cells, aminopyrene depletes white blood cells. These are very toxic combinations. You do not need many adults. There's a drug called H. You can have combinations of phenacetin, combinations of aminopyrene, diltiazam, which is a calcium channel block and reduces high blood pressure because of the double depressant effects of heroin. We also see in Ecuador, we also have uh, purity from the heroin manufacturing process. So you need to have 15 components in a liquid drug sample. You can have three or four 
but because of the nature of the adultery and, and, and the terror and the impurity of the heroin manufacturing process can be very toxic. The same in South Africa, as we've seen. We had the atypical samples that would have included pharmaceuticals and various chemicals that were taken from chemical supply stores. We also have very common adulterants, such as heroin mixed with finasin and acetaminophen that can cause overdose of acetaminophen and heroin cause double depression effects. So you just need one drug, cocaine, levamisole, and acetone. This is actually a very toxic combination. We see this in South Africa, we see this in the U.S. And next week, when we get into more of the adultery, so we're discussing next week on July 2nd, are the aspects of adultery that put a user at risk for COVID-19. But this is a very dangerous combination that we'll be getting into next week. It's very common on health. So what we have is, in drugs that we're seeing worldwide, now the new composition of drugs, we're seeing multiple drugs, multiple adults, multiple impurities, if it's from the heroin, impurities from the heroin manufacturing process. We do know, we do have an idea of what drug, what one drug and one adult can do. We know that heroin and acetaminophen can cause overdose with double depression effect. Acetaminophen too much can cause liver damage. Uh, we know that levamisole and cocaine can deplete white blood cells. We have a good grasp on what drug, what one drug and one adult can do. What we don't know is the synergistic and interactive effects of multiple drugs, multiple adults, the multiple impurities, we can assume that they're a lot more dangerous, a lot more toxic than one drug and one impurity. And drug samples like this, with all the different properties and effects on the pulmonary, the immune, the cardiovascular system, will definitely put substance use users at high risk for coronaviruses such as uh, COVID-19. What we do know about these drugs, uh, 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 about these different drug combinations, by looking at them, we know some of the properties of drugs, like a lot of these are stimulants, a lot of these are depressants. And you know if you, co if you combine one stimulant and one depressant, you get a speedball effect. You know, common, you know, speedballs are dangerous. A well-known speedball that's very dangerous is mixing two drugs, heroin and cocaine. Heroin and cocaine can put the heart under intense pressure and what stimulants give out and cause cardiac arrest and cause heart attack, heart failure. That's, you know, we've seen that in the entertainment world, well-known entertainment and comedian John Belushi from Saturday Night Live in the movie Animal House died at 38, 33 years old with a simple speedball combination of cocaine and heroin. But the speedball combinations we're seeing today with the drugs is a lot more dangerous because the drug mixtures today we're seeing worldwide are basically super speedball. You know, in this sample we see from Kentucky, you have two stimulants methamphetamine and cocaine. That's very powerful mixing two stimulants. You've got a double stimulant. But then you have heroin, four impurities from the heroin manufacturing process. And so therefore you get a couple depression effects. So this basically is a super speedball. So a lot of these drug combinations that we see today, they can cause overdose, they can cause death by this simple uh, combined speedball effect. In addition to other problems that they can cause on bodily organs and blood disorders that, that we have seen. What I want to get into real briefly is the question that it might be asked is uh, like like about uh, the antagonist naloxone that's used to reverse opioid overdose. The question you might have is what are these various drugs, what are these adulterants, what effects, do they have an effect on naloxone administration like fentanyl, the synthetic opioid drug? Like with fentanyl, we found out to, re to reverse overdose, have to use multiple administrations of naloxone. And we are finding that out also with different adulterants and drugs of abuse. Uh, for instance, research has shown that naloxone only partially reverses the toxic effects of tramadol overdose and may increase the risk of seizure. Naloxone will not reverse overdose resulting from non opioid like drugs like benzodiazepine, alprazolam. In the U.S., we are seeing, you know, increased heroin cut with alprazolam. That will definitely interfere with administration of naloxone to, uh, to try to reverse the overdose from heroin. Simply to put, the results of multiple toxic adulterants, control drugs, and improve the heroin manufacturing process in individual drug samples on naloxone are unknown, as are the synergistic and poisonous effects of these drug combinations on the user. We also found out that the banned analgesic metamazole that depletes white blood cells, that, that also has an effect. We're finding out the research that has been done has shown that metamazole 
like levamisole, levamisole potentiates or makes cocaine more powerful. Menomazole does the same with heroin, has a retention effect on heroin. And, and menomazole also uh, interferes with naloxone. One study found that naloxone was unable to reverse the effect of menomazole alone or combination with morphine. Another study found that a dose of naloxone that is completely effective to block morphine is only partially effective in blocking the super added effects of of, of, of metamazole. So to abolish the potentiated effect produced by this combination, it's like fentanyl is necessary to administer a higher doses of naloxone if that heroin opioid is cut with metamazole. The same has been found out with the metamazole. Part of our Colombo plan project, we are doing a research project with a research institute in Mexico City called Simbistav. This research institute also does studies for NIDA on uh, fentanyl. We have been doing, we've been doing studies on levamisole based with the duplicated potential effect of levamisole and cocaine. And we've proven that. But what we found out is that in addition to cocaine, levamisole also potentiates heroin and makes heroin that, more, that, that much more powerful. And the potentiation for lethality can be prevented by a dose of naloxone higher than that needed for the antagonized effects of heroin. Basically, what that says is, like metamazole, if your heroin contains levamazole, even like fentanyl, you need higher doses or repeated administration of naloxone to reverse an overdose where heroin has levamazole. Okay, what I'm going to basically, just to summarize, the adults have received worldwide the new adulterants, a banned pharmaceuticals, veterinary products, analgesic pain relievers, Antihistamines, sedatives, opioid pain medications, muscle relaxants, heart medications, impurities from the heroin manufacturing process. And these leads to a number of chronic and long term uh, health problems, bone marrow damage, damage to red and white blood cells, various infections and diseases, kidney failure, bladder cancer, bone marrow damage. Uh, basically, also, they damage the cardiovascular, the pulmonary, the immune system, the respiratory systems which could use this at high surface use at high risk for COVID-19. Okay, I'm going to stop here now because it's July 2nd. I'll continue and get into more details on how the various adulterants themselves or various cutting agents could have used it more at high risk for COVID-19. But uh, what we want to do is, I know Joanna has talked about uh, within a half day, she emailed me some questions that some people had and I got one here was uh, uh, on uh, South Asia. Was there any chemical profile on cocaine? Yeah, the only chemical uh, profile we get on cocaine, uh, Sri Lanka being home to the Colombo plan, we have we have this project which is temporarily suspended because of COVID-19. We can't travel overseas to test drugs. Well, we were able to test cocaine that was seized in Sri Lanka, and cocaine that uh, was following the trafficking route across the Atlantic Ocean into Africa and into Asia. It gets close to Sri Lanka, then to Australia and Southeast Asia. Yes, the cocaine in South Asia, the cocaine in Asia contains the veterinary products of Amazon that depletes white, white blood cells. And another question, are all adulterants necessarily pharmacologically active? Like I said before, not all adulterants are pharmacologically active. Some are benign, such as sugars like mannitol and lactose. Others are very pharmacologically active like metamazole that severely potentiates, makes cocaine more powerful, metamazole, which makes heroin more, more powerful. Okay, so some uh, adulterants are very pharmacologically active. Because the countries and regions work together to form each other on these chains. Yes, uh, there are a number of countries that have alert systems set up, especially in South America. Argentina has a very well-known one. Chile and Colombia have alert systems. The alert system set up in Argentina is where the uh, where the police drug testing labs get together with the public health people at least every two months, where they discuss uh, the new drug combination, this being a new psychoactive stuff, new adulterant. So they discuss this with the public health authorities to be able to try to figure out what effects these would have on the actual drug use. So there are countries that have set up public health it, 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 it alert system in their adulterants. Okay. Okay. Okay.
Okay, any tips, you know, how they, you know, what you can use in a treatment. Okay, well, yeah, do they use levamisole to extend the effect of cocaine? Yes, the traffickers use levamisole to extend the effect of cocaine. Because what happens is when you eradicate coca leaf or sees the cocaine process in the laboratory or sees cocaine in, in transit, the drug traffickers have a lesser supply of cocaine. The cocaine is less pure. So what they do is you have this ideal cutting agent, a veterinary product of amethyl that they just use to cut cocaine. To give you an example, I can have cocaine that doesn't have amethyl, 75% pure cocaine, and they have, say, they lidocaine or some other cutting agent for 75% pure cocaine. However, if I have severe cocaine shortage, my cocaine is only 35% pure. If I cut that with just 15% amethyl and other fillers, that 35% cocaine so it's less pure cocaine. It is a more potent, more dangerous form of cocaine than the 75% cocaine. That is the effect that with amosol and metabolite and metabolites have on cocaine. And uh, another question is, which I want to get into, which is very important, I want to give you. Many of you run a substance use treatment programs, you run outreach clinics or outreach centers, or you have a program where you actually provide service to substance use users. And so it's very important in this time, like you may ask, well, what should I do How to see, you know, if my client has been exposed to a doctor? Okay. Some rule of thumb, some tips that I can give. If your client has used cocaine hydrochloride anywhere in the world, it's estimated that 70% of the cocaine worldwide is adulterated with levamisole. Levamisole depletes white blood cells, compromise the immune system that could lead to infection diseases, put your client at risk for COVID-19. I would recommend, if you can, get a test for a white blood cell count because diminished white blood cells, your white blood cells are diminished because of levamisole aminopyrene that could be in cocaine also. So for cocaine users, if they're recently in the program, you'll want to do a white blood cell count to see what that white blood cell looks like. Uh, people that use crack cocaine, especially in South America, South Africa, the United States, the Caribbean, and Central America, crack cocaine is highly adulterated with phenacetin and aminopyrene. Phenacetin reduces red blood cells. It's very serious because red blood cells carry oxygen uh, to the brain. And if you deplete red blood cells, you deplete oxygen in the blood that leads to hypoxemia that can cause cardiovascular and pulmonary damage and also lead to you know, high risk for COVID-19. So if your clients have used crack cocaine, uh, you, you, you wanna, uh, what you want to do is you want to do tests for red blood cells, you know, to, to do a red blood cell count because the nascent will severely deplete red blood cells. And you're also going to want to do a kidney function test because the nascent also has serious effects on the kidney. It causes kidney failure and kidney damage. It also causes bladder cancer, which you might want to be checked on the bladder. But for crack cocaine users, you definitely want to do red blood cell count because phenacetin severely depletes red, 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 red blood cells. And, and uh, for methamphetamine, what we have found out is by research and by testing that methamphetamine is not cut that much. That methamphetamine is principally cut with caffeine. We don't see all these other toxic adulterants in methamphetamine. Basically, the one major cutting agent is used is caffeine. But as we have seen before, as we discussed before, caffeine with methamphetamine will cause cardiovascular damage. So over in Asia, where there's high level of methamphetamine use, which is highly cut with uh, caffeine, I would do cardiovascular tests on the heart for your clients when they first come into treatment, especially those that are severe methamphetamine use. Because the combination of methamphetamine and caffeine will cause cardiovascular damage. The parts of the world where heroin is covered with acetaminophen, such as Afghanistan, Southwest Asia, Central Asia, Kazakhstan, even the United States, we're seeing it cut. Because the acetaminophen does severe liver damage, I would conduct liver function tests on the client if they had used heroin that you suspect with acetaminophen. One thing I'd advise you all to do is a very cheap they're called pulse oximeters. They're used to measure oxygen levels in the blood during today's you know, day of COVID-19 pandemic. It's recommended that people get pulse oximeters because one of the symptoms of COVID-19 
is reduced levels of oxygen in the blood. You know, when you go to your doctors, you know, your doctors may use these. They just put these on your finger and it gives you a reading on the oxygen content in the blood should be between 95 and 100. Anything less than 95 is, is hypoxemia or low levels of concentration of oxygen in the blood. Especially, you know, crack cocaine, you use red. crack cocaine is covered in acid. That reduces red blood cells. That will result in low levels of concentration of oxygen in the blood. So these are very cheap. I would recommend getting them. And especially during these days of COVID-19, when your clients come into treatment, you, you can very easily test the oxygen levels in the, in the blood. It's a, it's a very useful tool to use. Okay, uh, Anna, are you there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we'll stop you there. I know that there were lots of questions came in and I, um, I fielded those and sent those over to Tom. So thank you very much for those of you that sent them. Um, we just don't have time, unfortunately. Such a um, wealth of information that needs to be conveyed in this time. Um, so we appreciate your patience as we've run over a little bit. We will um, come back to some of those questions next week. I know that the second part will be will cover off some of those. But also, if there are outstanding questions, then we'll put those in at one of our ISAP networks, and that will be on this topic. And the questions can can go there, and we can discuss and debate those as a as a group. Um, thank you, Tom. That was fascinating and um, really very in depth. So we appreciate and it was very well received the comments that were coming in. Thank you to all of our participants for joining us and we apologize there's some connection issues so um but we thank you for bearing with us and we will be having our next one uh which is on thursday the 2nd of july at the same time so we'll look forward to part two um but i really appreciate us covering this subject on the uh, on world drug day i think it's very apt that this particular day that we can really all come together and discuss that and thanks again, Tom, and I will look forward to seeing you all next week. Okay, my pleasure. Look forward to everybody next week. Okay. Thanks. Bye.